Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome anchor WABC, Sade Badrinwa. Hello, everyone. How are you? Are you well? Are you up? Are you awake? Uh, it's good to hear that. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm Sade Betterenmoi from WABC in New York, and it is a pleasure to be here today. And I love seeing all of these students out here, 400 students from around the globe. I, that's wonderful. Are you guys having a good time here in Qatar? You are? Well, I hope to hear from you. You know, we are about to uh, change the discussion here. It's going to really be free-flowing. Again, remember, you can use your iPad. We also have somebody standing by with a microphone if you have any questions. You know, we've covered a lot of ground here today so far. We've talked about the goals of Doha. We've talked about how sports can be a tool to build societies and strengthen the value of peace and justice, and also how it can be an agent of change. Now we're going to talk about the athletes that make up the sport. Uh, winning athletes, gold medal winning athletes. Come on up here, you guys. We have Marie Jose Perec, and we also have Carl Lewis, two dynamic Olympian champions. And Marie Jose Perec won three gold medals in track and field. The first in 92 in Barcelona in the 400 meter race, then in 96 in Atlanta in the 400 and 200 meters. And Carl Lewis, a part of the five American Olympic teams from 84 to 96, you are bad. <laughs> Nine gold medals, one silver, and you actually won four gold medals in a row for the long jump. Wow. Impressive, you guys. Yeah, they deserve a round of applause. Marie, let me begin with you. Take me back to that moment, the 200 meter race in Atlanta. Take me there. I mean, I will say, for me, the 200 in Atlanta was something that uh, no one was expecting because actually I was a 400 runner. And one year before that, uh, um, uh, the game, I decided that I would like to do the 200. I wanted to, to, to show, to, to, to tell people, of course, you can run 400, but I want to be a sprinter. So, what can I say about, about the race? Uh, well, from what I understand from that race, you were actually in fifth place when it came to 120 meters. So, you know, some people would say, okay, that's it. I've lost this one. <laughs> what was it in you that said, okay, I'm going to push forward? Because you, I mean, you work for it for four years. You, you are prepared. You, you know that you actually, you, you are not with the, the, I mean, the, 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 the specialists. You don't have the, the, the same power as, as they do. But something inside of me is, telling me, okay, you are here, you got to do something. You, you, you come on that event, you got to go back home with that, that gold. The people are waiting for you. You, you, can't, you can't get people disappointed. Everybody is watching. And I mean, I will say it's, it's so important that people understand that beyond this gold, you, we, we got something else. We, we, we have our, our co co communities waiting. We have... We, we, actually, we, we, we are the, 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 we, um, the voice of people can't talk, mm -hmm. can't say so you, something. So you, you felt that yeah. pressure, that determination to say, I've got to come back, mm -hmm. I've got to be a winner, and, and I've got to do it. And I will say, I mean, the, the last 100 meters was, was amazing because I, I, I actually found everything, everything come in place. And you get, you get to understand that we, we are practicing, re repeating the, 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 the technique every, every single day. So when, when, you, when you come at, the, at this moment and you actually got everything, you, you just feel overwhelmed because everything just become in place at the right moment. And okay. it, so it's fast so great to, so to, fast to get that to feeling. Me. Fast forward to me, all of a sudden you pick the fourth person off, then the third, then the second, and you're like, okay, <laughs> I've almost got it. Walk us through that moment where you're saying, okay, I'm going to take this last person out and I'm going to get to that winning line. 
I want to say that it was a, it was a very difficult uh, uh, moment because uh, uh, back then I was running with a, a woman called Merlin Oti from Jamaica, and she was my role model. So it was very very difficult to pass this woman <laughs> on the <laughs> last five meters. Until you uh, do. Yes. <laughs> but you did it. And, and Carl, uh, <laughs> let's go to you. 88 Olympics. You were in so many Olympics. Well, let's go to the 88 Olympics, the 100 meter. What did you have to deal with? You, you know what? I, I was there. I was there. And I, of course, I was in Atlanta. I mean, I, I was probably in a, felt like I was in 100 Olympics. But, but I remember that time and, and, um, when you were running that race. It was Merlene and Gwen Torrance. Remember Gwen yes, Torrance? Yes. They were tough sprinters. But for me, <clears throat> um, you know, a lot of people talk about that was the race with Ben Johnson, and that's what they remember. But for me, the thing is, is that about two minutes before the race started, um, they always say strip down, and I always kid and say I was. We're one of the great sports where they say you know strip down, and then I go to work. But um, they say strip down, and I remember the announcer saying, "Ladies and gentlemen, we have billions of people watching on television. We have 105,000 people. This will probably be the most rate watched." performance or event in the history of our world. Talk about pressure. And then the guy says, come to your mark. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of, and then in the 100 meters, you know, if you make one mistake, technically, really, you lost. So you just want to make sure that one mistake is in the beginning, so you're like mad the whole race, you know? Wow, so all of a sudden, you win that race. Can you, what is going through your mind? Well, you know, it's interesting about Seoul, which was the, ultimately got the race. You know, remember Seoul was the, the Ben Johnson race where he went across the line first. But I think that I was just listening to this um, speaking earlier. We we're talking about children in sports, and to me that was one of the defining moments of my career because, um, you know, I that that was he was disqualified for drug use. Remember, and so you have to. Many athletes get to a time where are we going to try to do something different? And when you mentioned. You thought about it a year before. Well, I thought about trying to go for four in 84 three years earlier. So it isn't just like, oh, we're going to run this race and do it. You actually plan for, for a period of time. And so for, for when you're going through this plan, like the vast majority of athletes, they work hard, they're dedicated, they're um, either running or swimming or whatever they do. And then you have to make a decision. Am I going to just try to be the best I possibly can be? Or am I, do I just want to win? Mm -hmm. And so to me, that was why that race was defining, because it, it, it defined for uh, many of us that we just wanted to be the best that we can be. And fortunately, that was good enough to win. You know, one commonality between the both of you, you both admit to being late bloomers. Marie, you actually <laughs> discovered sports by accident, and not until you were 16? Yes. Tell us actually, about that. Actually, I was at, uh, at school. And uh, I was spending one time playing, playing sports. And actually, my, uh, my, my teacher asked us to run a 60, 60 meters. And uh, I won. She looked at uh, her clock. And every, all my class won that 60. And she said, you, you have to go again. And I said, <laughs> why, why is she asking me something like that? Uh, well, I want to do it just once, just like everybody. She said, no, no, you have to go, otherwise I I go and see your grandmother because I grew up with my grandma. And I, I ran that 60, and she told me, okay, you, you, something is wrong with my, with my clock, so you, you need to come on Wednesday so we can, we can check some. So she thought something was wrong with her watch <laughs> because you, you ran so quickly. <laughs> yes. So you did and it again. I did it again, and then next week I won 100 meters. And I, I was actually qualified to, to go to France because I was born in Guadeloupe. Um, so I was qualified to go to the national championship for, for people of my age. So I discovered this like that. But you also need to know that uh, running was something that I just love doing. And you have one thing that I wanted to tell people. It's, it's like in 84, uh, my, I was my time when, when I had free time, uh, I, I was someone was I was uh, I, I were going to fish, f fishing with my family. Uh, I, none of my family was knew anything about sports. It's, I, I just discovered it and I I just embraced it. And the the it also it's important to know that I come from a very modest family. So for me, 
to, uh, to play sport, to, to, have, to, have, to have this opportunity to do something with my life, to, to do something for my community, to, to put Guadeloupe, I, I, I am French, of course, but to put that small island on a map, this is, was my, my goal. And it's why I say um, it, it's, not only about, it's not only about winning a goal, it's... It's much more it's than that. Much more. Yeah. Much more than that. Well, we're going to elaborate on that a little bit more. But Carl, tell me about you. You were a late bloomer too. Yeah. Even though you, you you told me that your parents started this uh, track, team, yeah. track team and you were a part of it, but you didn't really discover your talent, your speed until you were a teenager. Yeah, I, I was older, mm -hmm. and and you know it's interesting. I, I hear your story. My mother did the same thing when she was a junior in high school. She went out to a little competition, and a, co a college coach recognized her and said. Uh, come to a clinic and you want to go to college and that's what got her into college and this is back and I won't tell her a year but <laughs> um, and so she, when I was nine years old she started a track program for girls mainly because girls didn't have programs available mm -hmm. and so the boys joined and I ran for years learning technique enjoying it and and you know when I was listening earlier again you talked about you know getting involved in sports and I, I didn't know I grew up in New Jersey I didn't know much about the Jersey Shore. I didn't know that because all of my friends ran track. Our program had three or 400 kids. And this is what we did every summer. So um, when I turned about 16 is when I started to develop. I never thought I would develop into what I did. And I, I think it's important to just get out and just keep doing it, enjoy it. You know, do, do it with your friends and just, just enjoy it. It's not about winning at first. You know, it's, it's an easy thing to say. But I can say it because I wasn't winning at all. <laughs> you know, so I was back there in the back still enjoying myself. You know, let's, let's talk now. I think it's really important as we have all of these 400 students here. You know, it's really important in life to take the reins of success, to not rely on others, to not rely on your agent. Uh, Carl, can you talk, can you elaborate a little bit more? Because the, the landscape was a lot different when right. you were coming along. There weren't endorsement deals, and you really helped to change the game with that. Talk about that. Well, you know, it's interesting, I think, it's, and I'm really talking to a, a lot of you students over there. Put your cell phones down, all that stuff now. Stay focused on the day. But, but one of the things, when I was 18 years old, I looked at my coach, and, and uh, the first day I went to college, and I told him, you know, I want to be a millionaire, and I never want a real job. The first day. And he looked at me, for, he paused, he says, we, we better get to work. And it wasn't just a matter of running fast. I, I analyzed everything. When I went into a stadium um, and I saw 80,000 people and we were not getting any money, I said, someone's getting paid, so what's going on here? And when we were in substandard hotel rooms, uh, these are the kind of things I watched. And I watched interviews, and everyone in here who watched athletics, know, you know what I'm talking about. When they interview you at the end of the race and they're, well, I just had a great race, and you can't understand them. Just little things like that I watched. I took speech classes as a freshman in college so I could articulate what I felt. Business, marketing, finance. So what I tell, especially you young people, whether it's in sports or anything, you are your CEO. Take control of what you're doing. Um, if you hire a manager, create expectations. If you have a coach, create expectation and let them understand that you have a goal together, set to plan, work with them, and then stick to the plan. I see too many t people that leave their coach because they have problems with the manager. Well, you know what? The, the performance is what everything is all about. It should be you and that coach as a first relationship. Establish that relationship. Every, you, you, you can talk to so many great athletes, and they always have a coaching background or family that, that they admire the most. They don't, they don't talk about their manager. They talk about their coach or their friends. Mm -hmm. so, so establish that when you're young. Get the knowledge of how you're going to be successful and then be a leader all the way through it. You know, and also talk about, I think, to these young students, that it's really important to be a CEO of your career. Oh. How, do you, how do you lay out your vision? Because beyond the sports, you have to talk about the economics of the sport and how it's going to benefit you. But also, um, once we tackle that subject, you know, what is life after, after you've won the gold medals, after the notoriety is gone? Can yeah, you well, well the, the thing is, what I did is that I... Uh, very, very young, when I was 18, I started reading information about business information. And like I said, when I went to college, I went to college technically to manage my business. I decided I was going to be Carl Lewis for the rest of my life at 18 years old. So how do you run a business that I control? That's how it was. So um, you have to establish what you want to do, number one. Number two, it has to go beyond you. So, so like I said, I studied, uh, prepared myself. Not only that, I befriended people. 
in the entertainment business. I went to the Grammy Awards. When I was there, I wasn't sitting there gawking at the stage. I was running over to Michael Jackson saying, what do you do? What do you think? Mm -hmm. You know, I, all the time, it was, it was all of that and, and created established relationships. And, and then as time went on, um, finance people, I would ask them questions. How do you do this? What do you manage? Um, uh, when, when I was with a shoe company back in those days, I didn't like the uniforms. So I changed my contract where I had shoes and socks and I started designing my uniforms. I mean, you really have to say. Think outside the box. Always. And, and certainly and now it. with the advent of a Twitter, Facebook, yeah, you, all you, of these avenues exactly. allow you to think bigger and broader. Yeah, yeah. And Marie, let me get you in because, you know, as we're talking about endorsement deals, you guys saw each other in 94, and if I'm not mistaken, uh, you were actually in the LA Times at the time, so it was a lot different where you were coming along, she all of a sudden is there, where endorsements are there. Marie? Actually, I went uh, in the US, well, for, for training, and I remember that I, I met you at Montsac Relay, and I had just arrived in, uh, in LA. And you, congrat you congratulate me because I had half of the page in, a, in one page of, in, 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 a, uh, in the newspaper. And you told me, you see, what you are doing is good for the sport because we speak in, U in the U.S. about track and field only every four years. So keep doing what you are doing. Okay. <laughs> you know, well, um, I, mean, I mean, look at you. I mean, it's not difficult to put you on a picture somewhere. That no, sure helps. No, it's not. <laughs> You know, we, uh, we, we've talked about how the power of sports can help transform lives. And Carl, I know that's something that you're doing, you know, as we're talking about what do you do after the notoriety right. goes away, but you're giving back to your community with your foundation. Tell everyone about what you're doing. Well, the, the thing, the greatest thing that, that happened to me, I guess, in the beginning from sports was my manager, uh, Joe Douglas, uh, years ago when I was very young, when we used to travel in the very beginning, my first European tour was I was 17 and 18, he said, you are going to go to a restaurant, local restaurant, and a local museum every single time. So of course, at that age, we wanted to go to the fast food places, but he forced us to do that. And it, it, it made me understand and see the other cultures. And I thank him for so much for that, because so often we get so caught in, like you said, our box. And I was able to see, when I was in France, I went to great restaurants and to the Louvre, and when I went to Italy and all these places. And next thing you know, by the time I'm 19 and 20, I, I understood different food, different culture, and it just transformed my life. So, um, and then I started realizing that, you know what, it's not just about me and my country, it's about the world. So, so when I re retired, um, it's something I did. I started doing more, not only just charity work, but something that made a difference. And, and I always thought that relevance comes after your sport, not in it, because you just run fast or jump far. And so now I'm a United Nations ambassador. My foundation, I'm focused on education. My parents are both teachers. So, so I was able to understand that early because I was exposed to other cultures and other people. I love food from everywhere. I travel all the time and I have friends all over the earth. And I think that, uh, especially young people, it's, this is such an honor for you guys to be able to travel to see these cultures and, and take in the information. Don't, don't um, bring America here, take this culture home and take it with you because it'll, it'll enrich you in a way that you can't imagine. And I think that's the best thing I learned out of sports. So now when I go back to my high school four years ago, my, my high school team was one of the worst in South Jersey. We were the best in the nation when I left. And, and, and I looked around, I said, wait a minute, what happened? Mm -hmm. and it was expectation. It, they, we had, they had created a culture of mediocrity. So I said, I, I looked at those ninth graders and I said, you will be champions of the state of New Jersey before you graduate. And they looked at me like, yeah, right. They were second place by two points their 12th grade season. And the entire team, not only that, but the entire team was on, uh, did very well in school. That's we had great. multiple kids in college because we had to raise the whole stakes. Right. And so that's what we have to do. We have to create this, uh, stop the culture of mediocrity and speak and teach excellence. And you do that part by understanding the world and that's what I have. Fantastic. And it gives you the ability to pass oneself. Marie. For you, uh, this is something you talked about even in the beginning, how it's so important to give back. You're doing the same thing as well. Actually, for, um, I will say that for, for more than 10 years, uh, my husband, that is also an, uh, an Olympian, uh, we start a project in France that uh, we put all athletes together, non-Olympic uh, and Olympic athletes, and we, uh, uh, we actually 200 athletes 
and we try to uh, uh, help the, the youngest athletes uh, by sharing our experiences, give it, giving them tools so they can uh, go uh, faster in, in, uh, to, to, to reach their goal. Uh, it's, I mean, it's so interesting to see um, all of these sports, all of the different uh, 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 people from dif different sports, it's so interesting to see uh, uh, all the information that you, can, that you can put together and help the people to go further. And, and the thing, it's not only uh, uh, um, for them to, succeed, to, to succeed in, in sports, it's also to teach them that uh, you have a chance to, to do something uh, in, in that level, but you need to go further and help, help around you, not only the people in sports, so you can make a change. So it's, Having it's, it's impact, very, very interesting. An impact in the world, which is most important. Uh, we are going to wrap up, but are there any students that have a question? Any one of you? No? Shame on you. <laughs> Shame on you. <laughs> That's okay. I'm going to take one question from the iPad. And uh, Carl, this was kind of for you. Uh, do you think that many competitors feel that doping is a new normal and that because everyone else is doing it, that their behavior is acceptable in their minds? Well, you know, it, it's, I think it's like anything in society. People create their own reality. Um, the vast majority, anyone that's in sports knows the vast majority of athletes overall do not take drugs and they don't want to take drugs. Um, but we've always had a culture where people wanted to take drugs. So I, I think that what we should do is, let's, see, just, let's just say America where we are. Um, we're, we're creating a culture, I think, with our, our young kids uh, we're not, where we, I think, are helping people to think that's acceptable in a lot of ways where we have people that many of them are not involved in sports say, oh, it's okay. Well, you don't understand what sports are about then if you think it's okay to cheat because that's not the message. And number two, we need to be, sure, we need to be careful about teaching our kids at a young age that it's, it's, it's okay to... to receive something for just being there. You know, I, I did an eighth grade commencement speech because a friend of mine asked me to do an eighth grade commencement speech. And the first thing I said is, I have no idea why I'm here. You know, you, you go from kindergarten to first grade, then you graduate from high school. Why are we getting, why are we graduating eighth grade? You go to ninth grade, you know? Well, every, they want to celebrate because you're going to a new school. That's the celebration. Or everybody wins in school. You know, everyone gets a trophy. Well, no, everyone doesn't win. Kids understand that, Get, and, and we should tell the kids to score. You, everyone isn't the best. That's okay. That's something to learn young so that you work harder and you understand that maybe this isn't the direction. So I think that we, in a way that we're, we're hovering over our young students and children, and we're afraid for them to see the reality and the complexity of the world that we live in, and, and they're a lot more complex than we think, and they can figure that out. What we should focus on is saying, it's okay. Let's try something else. Let's be the best that you can be. You're not always going to win at everything, but you can be great at something. So I think that, that we are, in, in essence, creating a culture where it's okay because everyone's supposed to be able to win. Okay. Carl Lewis, Marie Jose Brick. <laughs> thank you both for joining us. And thank you. students, I know oh, you're going to have some questions thank afterwards. You. They're going to come around. Let's give them both a warm round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Very good. Very good.